Uh, to start off with, why don't we go around and everybody give me one sentence just kind of describing who you are and your background, and then one sentence describing what you're working on and how it relates to interoperability. I'm Joseph Weinberg. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Paycase Financial in Canada. Um, and we've been working on the Shift Network for the last about 16 months. I'm an early investor in Bitcoin in late 2010. I've um, been working on regulatory requirements and policy changes with the OECD and helping kind of to progress the space across a bunch of different areas. So. Hey, uh, I'm Nick Hill. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alchemy. Uh, my background is in AI research from Stanford, and we are basically build the leading blockchain intelligence platform that powers the world's largest crypto hedge funds and financial institutions. Uh, we basically, a little bit of a sneak peek, tomorrow at the, one of the workshops, turbocharging and blockchain development, we're gonna be announcing our developer platform. And I think that's where the interoperability piece comes in. We've spent a lot of time building out a massive developer infrastructure that allows us to build cross blockchain applications. And we're gonna be opening that up to people tomorrow. So definitely come check it out. Hi, my name is Jake Kwan. Um, I'm a developer. I've been here in the Bay Area for about over a decade. I'm the um, co-founder of Tendermint and the Cosmos Network. Uh, so I've been working on Tendermint, which is a leading solution to proof of stake and Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. And we're soon launching the Cosmos Hub, the Cosmos Network being uh, the interoperability solution for, uh, for, for blockchains. Hey, I'm Kevin. I work at Kava. I'm a researcher and developer there. Uh, I'm a former data scientist. Got into blockchain about two years ago. Uh, at Kava, we focus on like implementing interoperability solutions, uh, sort of as a MVP, uh, using the Interledger protocol, which was developed originally by Ripple. But now we focus uh, on sort of cross-asset communication. Um, and so I have some interesting things about interoperability to uh, share with people. Excellent. So, uh, and I am Hasib Qureshi, I'm a partner at Metastable Capital, and uh, like the rest of you, I'm here to learn. Uh, so, these guys know interoperability better than anyone, but uh, let's kind of motivate the problem a little bit, because it might not be obvious to, you know, some people who are, who are new to blockchain or who don't really understand what the implications of all these separate chains trying to talk to each other might be. Um, and before we actually dive into it, I, I kind of want to take a survey of the crowd here. Um, how many people feel like they, they, they know what blockchain interoperability means? Okay, how many people know what cross-chain atomic swaps are? Okay, got it. So that kind of gives you a sense of where the room is at and hopefully, you know, you folks in the room will, are, are gonna learn a lot today about how interoperability works. So uh, first, before we dive into like the mechanics of interoperability, um, why is this an important problem? Why do we care about this? What are the problems that need solving through blockchain interop? So, um, I mean, if you just look at the internet, I think it's a really good, you know, first use case. I mean, effectively what you have is you have a, a bunch of networks that are being built in very different ways to solve many different problems, both some of the same and some very, very different in use cases. Um, and if you aren't able to effectively, you know, cross communicate across use cases, problem sets, ecosystems and economies really, you know, because we are really building economies um, at the protocol layer, um, you kind of have an inability for us to all, you know, truly, you know, uh, take on what really trying to be built here and to really see the true scale of what can be built um, and I think that you all need to speak the same language and inherently that's really not what's happening today um, and so the intranets that are being built in many ways need the ability for us all to you know seamlessly start to merge all these things together to build you know more uh, more, more more universality in what's happening yeah I think just to add on to what Joseph said there the, the world will either evolve in one of two ways, right? Either there'll be like one massive blockchain that does everything, which is highly unlikely given the history of any kind of like platform, um, or it'll have multiple different blockchains. And in that case, like you said, you know, you need to have the ability to interop, both interoperate between them and also build applications that integrate with multiple of these blockchains. And I think as you see more and more developer platforms launch, and we see a shift from just pure, more like asset swapping to, hey, I wanna use this chain as a compute network, this chain as a storage network. You'll see a lot more applications that span multiple types of chains. So um, I, I think of interoperability as being primarily a problem of blockchain communication. So how do you get two blockchains to be aware of each other and securely communicate packets, which I think is a really, really high value and simple primitive that can be used to construct scaling solutions and, uh, and expand this ecosystem of blockchains. 
So uh, it's, 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 it's a, in, in my opinion, a natural evolution of, of where blockchains need to go in order to solve the immediate problem of scalability, but going into the future, something that evolves towards uh, uh, you know, uh, a richer ecosystem of, of sovereign blockchains with their own application. Yeah, I think those are some really good points. I think the intranet to internet uh, analogy is something that we're all experiencing right now in terms of many chains uh, often incompatible with one another, no standard in which uh, to interoperate all of them. And obviously, if we can't get to that place, you know, there's, there's obvious problems with how are we exchanging assets. If it's only in a centralized uh, solution to do so, uh, you kind of are limiting the possibility space uh, that developers and users have. Um, and so getting to this like generalized solution for value transfer between potentially very different chains uh, is kind of like an important primitive for the growth and adoption of the industry. So that's, that's an interesting point. It kind of touches on the fact that, you know, for crypto right now, most of the use cases are financial and speculative, right? Uh, and in a way, you could almost say that the, the, the first and, and, you know, one of the major killer apps of crypto was actually related to interoperability, which are exchanges. Like exchanges actually have to run nodes on all these systems and they have to be in sync with them and they have to be aware of, of what's going on in all these different systems. Um, so, you know, what do you, what do you think are potentially some of the future financial implications if we can get blockchain interoperability working at a, at a, at a deeper layer than we currently do? I'll take a stab at that. I've thought about it a lot. Uh, I think the main thing you would see is you start to see uh, applications abstracted away from the tokens that they access. And so, that would mean that for a user, they expect to have uh, an interaction with an application that just works. They're unaware of if there were tokens that were converted, if there were tokens that were used during that interaction. Um, and then also from a developer perspective, uh, we would start to see developers reasoning more about the abstraction of building a blockchain application as opposed to building a blockchain application on top of X blockchain. Yeah, this is gonna change. Um... The, the pressure right now for, people, for projects to have ICOs, to have their own token, and, and some of that justification for why you need a token might go away because you, know, you can interrupt with all the existing tokens that already exist. So people are going to have to um, define really what the utility and use case for that token is and, and, and justify it, hopefully. So that, you know, this. Um, it's actually interesting you brought up exchanges as one of the main cross-chain uh, the early kind of cross-chain applications. And it's the whole point of doing cross-chain stuff, one of, one of the points of interoperability is that you can actually replace exchanges. And if you actually think about it, exchanges are fantastic for the purpose they serve right now, but have actually been pretty not great for the industry as a whole. Because when you look at big things like, oh, Bitcoin got hacked or this company got hacked, it's mostly the exchanges code that got hacked. Um, so having the ability to eliminate that and run this in a trustless manner will be really great for the industry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of to play on that as well. I mean, this is all about building marketplaces, right? These are all about building new ways of forming ecosystems. And that is the very, you know, base layer. It's about the value or the marketplace of value, right? And so how these things start to all kind of start to work together in more seamless ways is really a question of how good all of these different projects can all start to formulate these new marketplaces with that same idea. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. So let's assume then that you guys are, are right and you guys win, okay? Let's, let's fast forward, you know, say 10, 15 years in the future, you know, it's, it's 2030 or 2035 and blockchain interoperability has been decisively solved. What does the future user experience of a user interacting with crypto look like in that world? I don't even think that they'll even know that it's even involved. I mean, I think, to, I think the important thing here is to remember that you know, databases are back in infrastructure systems and a lot of what's being built in the blockchain space is low level architecture requirements for the next future of what databasing looks like in many ways. Um, the, the goal is so that no one even here even talks about blockchains. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that everyone's just starting to learn and to really understand, but over time, that should be the goal, is that we don't even know these things are even happening. Interoperability, what's that? We don't know. We just know that I'm sending a message from one place to another, or I've transacted in three different formats of value in order to solve some wider solution for the consumer or the enterprise. Um, that's my opinion, at least. But. Yeah, I think that's spot on, and I think just kind of like, emphasizing a point that I'm pretty sure you made there was 
once we have applications that give true benefits to users beyond just saying, hey, this is decentralized, that's when we'll see a huge uh, explosion in blockchain. I think, I think uh, you're absolutely right. And when we have just the word blockchain is abstracted away and, hey, I'm using this application. No one says like, hey, I'm using this database that lets me share photos. They say I'm using Instagram, right? And I think when you hit that, we'll see a big explosion there. I think it's an interesting question because there are two protocol wars that are happening or are about to happen. One is in consensus, like what kind of consensus algorithms should we use for blockchains, proof of work or proof of stake, liveness versus safety. And then the other is the IBC protocol. They're like very related, intertwined. Um, but uh, so to try to answer, I think a part of the question that you asked is what would, what would it look like in the future when all this is solved? I think we'll see something like a URL scheme like a common identifier string that kind of uh, tells you where in the network you are and where in the network you want to send your coins to. Um, so, so that kind of convention can arise kind of independently of the stack of consensus and, and so on. Um, but for, the first step would be for existing wallets and so on to, 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 to be able to, uh, well, okay. The first step is to figure out the consensus protocol wars. I think once we have some kind of answer there and there's like a dominant answer, then all the wallets can start to integrate with them much more easily. Yeah, and to really like sort of frame it uh, in sort of an interesting way, like uh, interoperability is not generally the trend in the world. Uh, if I own a bank, I would prefer people to have accounts at my bank. If I run an application, I would prefer that users use my application directly, however that, that is, to monetize my application. And so if we exist in this world where in the blockchain space interoperability has become successful, that it's been abstracted away from users and that it's sort of just, as you say, a database structure that works, I would expect that we would start to see things in the traditionally centralized world start to become more interoperable and less centralized because these primitives would work across systems in a way that like was never really possible nor incentivized before. And so I think it would be like a very powerful shift, not just like in the blockchain space as we think about it today, but in the general uh, economy. Can I ask you a question? Yep. What, do, what do you guys think about the, the correlation to the way the TCP IP versus the World Wide Web that kind of you know, helped us? In some ways, the web kind of builds a standard way for all of us to communicate across multiple layers of protocols. Do you guys see that as the thing, or do you see the base layers as having to all work together primarily? I, I think that's a great analogy for um, uh, for how we might create a network of interoperable blockchains. And so Cosmos kind of took that idea and, and applied it to the blockchain space. So uh, instead of TCP IP, which is physical, you know, uh, electronic communication between two computers, you have IBC, which is Merkle proofed, uh, proof of you know, packet intent to send. Um, but otherwise, if you think of a blockchain as being a computer that happens to be decentralized in, in the cloud with no single location, then it, they're pretty similar. Yeah, and that's actually the same that we've done in at Shift, is that we've basically said interoperability is the number one thing. And so using like Merkle tree proofs as a way to actually do that, that exact same thing, we've taken the exact same thing. So. Question. You got a new moderator now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Just I'm going to moderate. I'm going to step in here. Um, cool. So that's an exciting vision for where the future of blockchain interoperability might go. But of course, you know, blockchain interoperability has been an idea in the air for a very long time. You know, like since the very beginning of people trading crypto, uh, people have wanted to uh, trustlessly do this across different blockchains. So um, tell me a little bit about the history of interoperability and kind of, you know, obviously this is not the first go we've had at trying to make these things work. Uh, what are some of the predecessors to the approaches that you guys are taking today? And actually, Jay, I think you might be a good person to start giving the answer since you're one of the OG interoperability guys on stage here. So the question is... Uh, can, can, Tell me a bit about the history of interoperability and okay. other approaches that sure. maybe haven't worked or that are dead ends uh -huh. or that require us to go farther to make this really a okay. full-fledged solution. So I'll, I'll just give like a brief overview of how I think it evolved from what I saw. Um, so at first, there was the first thing I saw on Bitcoin about interoperability was atomic cross-chain transactions. So it's using a hash, uh, a secret, and a commit system, a commit reveal system, in order to make sure that two transactions go through at the same time. But you can use this trick across blockchains. So, so essentially, you can get cross-blockchain uh, uh, atomic transactions. And then the next thing 
that, that, that came out was the Lightning Network, I guess, with, uh, with Joseph Poon, that kind of connected this kind of payment channel uh, across multiple blockchains. So it's another way of interoperating, specifically by sending value payments, um, although it's not quite as general, uh, not, not quite as good as, uh, as general uh, uh, packet transfers, which can be used for more applications. Um, uh, I don't know, at that point, um, uh, I, I don't know what followed, but as soon as um, we, uh, we had to figure out, you know, what, uh, we have this Tendermint core stack, which solves consensus, and we, we were thinking about what kind of application the blockchain space needs. Uh, we, were, uh, we discovered a way to use the consensus proofs as a way for two blockchains to communicate and started developing concept for the Cosmos network. Uh, oh, there's one more thing I forgot, which is uh, ILP. <laughs> right. So uh, Ripple came out with ILP, which is uh, uh, which in their paper they they specify two kinds of uh, cross blockchain communication or cross ledger communication. One being the hash locked kind that I was talking about, and then the other using a set of notaries as signers. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to add in, it's not exactly the same on interoperability, but I think it plays much to it, is that we were working pretty closely with Blockstream in the early days when they were looking at federated systems for the Liquid Network. Um, and the concept of looking at two-way peg-in systems on Bitcoin is a way to effectively initially look at scalability. Um, but then looking at how you would then, and this I think actually went into the early creations of what Lightning would actually look like and how you actually build layer twos and layer threes. So it's, it, it, was a, it was a precursor that I think is, and of course Rootstock is heavily using this as a way to effectively peg in um, their EVM effectively into the Bitcoin network. So these types of things I think were as well part of the earlier times. Yeah, I actually forgot to mention pegging. So yeah, when, um, when uh, uh, what is it, what's block, uh, what's, Blockstream came up with, yeah, thank you, uh, with the, uh, the sidechain white paper. I think that yes. was one of the original ones for uh, interoperability, but with Bitcoin at the center and two-way pegging to other blockchains with, uh, yeah. Um, and so, so that, was, that was very interesting. Um, the, I, I guess it's important to, to know that two-way pegging is very different than like Lightning Network or... Um, or, or atomic cross-chain transactions or payment channels. So like with two-way pegging, you can, you can have uh, a sort of a transfer, like a, literally moving assets or what have you from one chain to another. But uh, uh, so you can, you can do a lot um, uh, using this method. Uh, but, uh, uh, but when it comes to Lightning Networks, you can really, it's, it's really geared for, it's really good for sending payments. Um, so it, it's, it's a difference between like if I want to give some my, my parents like shares of Apple, for example, right, versus give them money. They're not the same thing. Sometimes I really want to give them equity you know, and I don't yeah. want to just give them the money. Yeah. I mean, I would kind of correlate two-way peg-ins to something similar to what you look at in bridging technologies and things that have been working on in the bridging space. Shift has effectively all been focused on bridging as a way to build interoperability um, and how you look at Merkle Light proofs as a way to actually build bridging across blockchains. Um, but it's very similar in that you're effectively t you're taking a certain transaction, you're effectively locking it in um, into some sort of transaction, you're building a Merkle root or a proof off of that that then instantiates some sort of another chain or enables us to basically peg in another uh, existing chain for some sort of an interoperability perspective. I've got a question. Uh, so what consensus algorithm are you guys using for uh, coming They're, to agreement? For, for shift? Yeah. So shift. today it sits as proof of work, but we'll move over to some sort of a hybrid. Okay. We found that, you know, in our research with Blockstream and of just generally is that until we have further understanding on how POS works, we can't get over the fact that POS is a hard time in most environments of, of being, you know, um, call it working one-to-one -one for every vote. Um, and so we look at POW at least today, just to maintain it. But. With the hybrid being like a proof of stake system on top of it? Yeah, exactly. Like that's what, yeah, we know that that would probably work in most cases. And so until we have further research on POS being efficient, we'll stick to POW. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this kind of highlights like a few trends that I think that I've abstracted sort of not having been around for 10 years or whatever, which is like, Early interoperability tended to be closer to the base layer. Now we are much uh, more likely to be talking about interoper interoperation at higher layers. Um, so that's like interoperable payment channel networks, um, as well as like interoperable state channel networks now, as well as in some ways you can think about it as like these uh, ways of speeding up consensus. And so uh, Lightning Network in some ways is just a way of creating a fast finality sidechain on top of Bitcoin. 
And once I have that fast finality blockchain, this is what we do with ILP, we say like, well now if I assume things start out in the Lightning Network, I have very fast finality Bitcoin, I can exchange it with very fast finality, say Ether locked up in a payment channel, and now I'm doing swaps at basically internet speed as opposed to these atomic, and now I can do very small packets, I can do all sorts of like interesting things with that, whereas previously it was like I would shoot off one payment, wait an hour, and it would atomically fail or succeed, and the use case there is just not very compelling. Right. And so now we're like, we're higher abstracted, a little bit harder to engineer, but much faster and much better potential for user experience and sort of adoption. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's also the, I think it's not a bad thing, right? Like Bitcoin is, is not slow by, you know, a mistake. It's not a bug, it's a feature, right? That you want things to ensure finality is there and that, to, that things actually work. Um, where you speed up, higher you go, it's up to everyone. So, so speaking then of some of the variation in, in mechanism design around these different systems, um, how do you guys see incentives playing what role do you see incentives playing in designing these interoperability systems? Because obviously for, for any particular blockchain, its security is dependent on this interplay between you know, consensus and economics and you know, mechanism design. When you're combining multiple blockchains together, how do you stitch a full security picture across multiple different consensus mechanisms potentially? I think this is a, a great question. <laughs> no, I think this is real <laughs> tough. Um, just thinking about it from first principles. Uh, Interoperability, it would be great, and this is what we see in general business, like if someone just owned the rails. But like obviously the outcomes you get there are usually rent-seeking monopoly. Um, and so like how do we design an interoperability solution that there's some incentive to do it? We need people to operate these things or to literally to write the code that makes them work, to maintain the code, to keep up with changes between blockchains that may not be, you know, if, if Lightning Network 2.0 comes out and interoperability solutions are using Lightning Network 1.0, Who's the person that is incentivized to, to upgrade? Who's the person that's incentivized to maintain these protocols um, is something that's like an open question. That, you know, if I run a token, I'm like, everyone's gonna use my token. I don't care about interoperability. If I, you know, run a fund, I'm like, yeah, it sounds great, but like, how do I make money off of these decentralized railroad tracks that you're building? Like, what's, what's the purpose of this here? And so tackling that question, I think, is one of the reasons why interoperability has been slow to coalesce around standards, because you're not just solving a technical problem, it, there's an incentive problem as well. I think that the best way to get security, the best security, is to have a staking token that you bond and you start participating in a system where if you do something wrong in one part of the system, then you get punched all throughout. And that way you get to it's it's like it's like your your the amount of stake you're putting for that given staking token is is is, is additive across all of the uh, uh, validation that you're doing or bridge slash peg gatekeeping right um, and 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 uh, yeah so thinking about the the staking model um, it's in the case of the Cosmos network it's the validators or stakeholders who uh, would also be you know, uh, participating in pegs, although in the Cosmos network, anyone can create a peg as well and compete if they think they have a better pegging system. So we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out over time. Um, I, I also want to mention that I think in the long run, we're going to also be thinking about like recovery mechanisms when these blockchains fail. And so I was just thinking um, about, uh, for example, what would happen if the Cosmos hub were to fail? Right? How do you deal with that in the case of when uh, more than, say, 50% of the stake is gone and offline? Uh, so, you know, one way to solve that might be to have a, a, a recovery blockchain that is independent of the Cosmos hub, and all of its job is just to record, uh, given the, 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 the voting power of the original chain, uh, vote on which which way to reorganize and then have a finality, uh, have a synchronous period where after the end of the synchronous period, this recovery chain says, here's the deterministic result based on the votes that have been aggregated, right? And, and then you're going to have to incentivize those actors too, so. But whenever you think about creating new kinds of actor subsets and incentivizing them, there, there's always the question right now that we haven't figured out, I think, of, yeah, is that a new token or is that, is that shared with the original staking token and so on? Yeah, on that side. So um, we haven't released it quite yet, but we've been working um, on something actually very similar to what you've just been describing. Um, the way that Shift effectively works is it looks 
the, the network effectively works to look at, at chain health. And so in the event of perverse adversarial conditions against the network, it can effectively do things like look at itself or allow what we call a ring of certain nodes that'll actually basically look at, at, at certain conditions and basically try to reinstantiate itself in the event that in the, in, the, in the event that some sort of a DDoS attack happens. So, but it's exactly in those exact things we're trying to experiment to understand those at the same time. Um, but it's still early days for sure. Cool. So one question then. So we have a lot of developers here today at, uh, as a blockchain week. So w one question I have, and actually Nikhil, I'll direct this towards you. How uh, are the developer tools going to need to adopt to this new multi-blockchain model that we're going to have if we actually realize the dream of interoperability? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And to, to give a little context, at Alchemy, we build multi-blockchain. We basically build an application that spans multiple different blockchains and powers decision-making for investment professionals that <clears throat> uses the data from these different blockchains. So what we've had to do is actually spin up a ton of infrastructure. We spend a ton of money on Amazon to build ways, because when you think about it fundamentally, a node is actually not meant as a data like storage and query mechanism. It's meant to have one specific purpose, which is to support the network, not to be this random access database that lets me provide the perfect data visualization. And when you think about applications in the future, let's say this multi-blockchain world plays out like we've been talking about, if you have an application that spans multiple blockchains, both as a developer and the consumer, it's suddenly your, your, your requirements to build an application have drastically skyrocketed, right? Because even right now, when you think about building a website or an iPhone app, it's orders of magnitude simpler than building a blockchain application because of the tooling and the developer infrastructure and just all these people have come along earlier and made that process really smooth. When you think about having to do that blockchain, now I need to do that for, if I, let's say I have an application feature that uses some kind of storage chain and some kind of compute chain and some kind of of, uh, another chain and now I have to build a write code that handles all those different applications chains I need to write spin up nodes for each of those chains I need to handle all the idiosyncrasies I need to develop infrastructure that lets me access the node in the way I need to so there's a lot of effort that goes into this and that's kind of what we're really excited about opening up um, over the next uh, couple months the short answer is like blockchain development needs to become more like regular development uh, when you approach these things as like an outsider, you look at the development stack and you're like, wow, this is like developing on the web in like 92 or something. It's just like, it's not a good experience. Nothing works and there's often no one to ask why it doesn't work. You're the first one doing it. Um, and so getting to a point where the tools are recognizable to people who haven't been doing this for five years is like a big step. And then making the abstraction so that if I develop an application that works on one blockchain or works uh, with multiple blockchains, it will continue to do so without me constantly monitoring whether or not the underlying state machine has changed. So um, what we're talking about, how to make interoperable blockchains and how to create this ecosystem, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built, but I think the first one that needs to get built is a framework, uh, okay, there are two reasons why we need a framework for developing uh, uh, application-specific blockchains. One is there's not a very good framework right now. Um, uh, you can build in Solidity, but it's, it doesn't quite give you the control of uh, customizing the blockchain stack that a blockchain framework should. So we developed the Cosmos SDK, which is a framework for developing a blockchain in Golang, which is uh, Google's language, Go. Um, and the idea is it's a, good, it's a good framework for developing an independent blockchain, but it also happens to have all of these libraries and modules that you can import. So there's this IBC module that you'll be able to import if you build on the SDK. Um, and it's kind of like importing a TCP IP library. So it is a lot like just developing in the, in the traditional software world. So it, it sounds like, uh, you know, everybody at this table, they you know, they, they already understand how difficult it is to develop on blockchains. And, you know, in a, in a multi-blockchain world, it's going to be orders of magnitude more difficult, right? Because already it's difficult to reason about what it's like to build an application that's consistent and has, you know, sensible logic in a system that is eventually consistent like most proof-of-work-based blockchains. Um, so there, there's some elements, it seems, of, of interoperability, you know, to inject a little bit of realism are kind of always going to be hard. Um, what do you think are some of those kind of cold hard facts about interoperability that we might 
sort of might never quite simplify or might never get easy. I was going to say, so much like foreign exchange markets, I don't think that an infinite number of trading pairs is going to be the paradigm. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a need for standards to adopt and then for major trading pairs or like major, and this is trading pairs in the sense of like useful things are going to need to be uh, developed, agreed upon, and tooling built around. Um, because like the, the logic of going between n squared pairs where n is very large is always going to be a difficult problem. You're never gonna be able to fully abstract that away, especially when you have differences at the consensus layer at the layer two. Um, and so there's going to need to be a consolidation around what tools people want to use, and then those tools themselves will need to scale to a degree that they are useful for large-scale applications. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think, I think there's this interesting trade-off between, if you even like take a step back, let's say you're trying to bridge these two different chains, or it can even be like, just call it two different applications in general. You can actually, so the trade-off is, you can either build something that's very native to the, that understands the chains and have a really tight mesh, but what happens is then if you have a new chain that comes in that's slightly different, different consensus mechanism, or whatever it is, then you can't integrate that chain. Versus if you make it more flexible, you can have something that will maybe take out, take into consideration new types of chains that develop, but may not be as tightly integrated. So I think one challenge as we move forward is, what is the right balance there? Do we make interoperability that's very tightly designed for the chains that we have right now? Or do we look at something that's, hey, let's get a more broad perspective. So any new future things, can we incorporate those into our model? Yeah, and just to add on that. So that's like essentially the distinction I see between what I work on ILP and IBC. IBC makes some assumptions about like the consensus mechanism being Tendermint or Tendermint-like and sort of we can, we can work really nicely between chains if that is true. ILP tries to take the stance of like, what if there's absolutely nothing that we can assume is, com is common between these systems? Like what could we possibly have as a standard? Minimizes that standard so that it is possible to interoperate these systems, but then you trade off things where essentially like the source of trust in a, a Tendermint zone or a, the hub is that this decentralized hub is acting honestly. IBC relaxes that and says you have these like individual pairs, these bilateral parties who can meter trust between one another and so that I don't have to extend infinite credit to you but I can extend a small amount of credit to you and we can build a relationship that way and we can scale quote unquote this trust metric uh, between parties or we can do it sort of in this decentralized hub manner where we say like if I trust the hub then going from zone A to zone B through the hub is considered secure and I think one of the open questions is like if there's an, a larger number of chains and they're very heterogeneous, we may see solutions that are more akin to ILP as the TCP IP layer. And then we may see things that are more like IBC essentially doing like uh, streaming type applications or more specialized applications where there's a lot of state involved, where ILP doesn't seem to be able to really like handle that kind of uh, transaction between things where it's very important that state is kept between things. I would say speed too. Um, just in, from the perspective that, you know, we won't have instantaneous, I think, most of anything because that's by default not a good thing uh, in the blockchain space. Um, again, that's a feature, not a bug, but I mean. Jay, you have an answer? I want to hear your answer here. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think uh, for, for all proof of stake, in proof of work systems too, whenever it comes to pegging, you, you have to consider the cases of when each side fails. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a hub and spoke model, but um, if there is a hub and spoke model because one blockchain happens to have many connections outward, right? Um, what does failure look like and what is the recovery like? This is something we're gonna have to figure out. And there's like many choices, including like, oh, we can rely on social consensus to figure it out. So, you know, all kinds of drawbacks you know, among the choices that are available that we know of today. Um, and then what happens when the zone fails as well? Um, is there a governance mechanism on a hub? Um, I think that one of the challenges is going to be simplifying the, the structure of this network and how it functions so that people understand it. So like the notion of a hub is really attractive to me because it's, it's, it's simpler to understand. A hub and spoke is simpler to understand than a, you know, a, a graph, right? Um, but, um, but it has, um, uh, you know, and drawbacks as well. So I think uh, the challenge would be coming up with a scheme like the URL scheme I was mentioning earlier that makes it all easier to understand. Uh, lots of work to be done there in UX. So another aspect where I think interoperability is quite complex is in its implications on privacy. 
So how do you think interoperability plays with the privacy guarantees that individual blockchains are able to make? The way I think of privacy for the Cosmos Hub anyways, it's like you want there to be a hub, a common hub that shows where all the side chains are and how many coins it has. You kind of want to know that. Because like in the case of all kinds of failures, like maybe some of the encryption is wrong in this, you know, this privacy zone. And, and you just have to know that, okay, well, at least we know how much it has so we can isolate that problem from the rest of this problem. And, and I think people uh, arguably would have comfort in kind of knowing large-scale economic activity, right? It's kind of scary to consider like a completely private hub that functions with zero knowledge and you don't know exactly what's going on in the world, you know? Um, so, so I like to think of pushing privacy to the edges as much as possible. So within, within a side chain that's connected to a hub, it can have privacy features in there. It's also more amenable to, um, to, to porting this over to the traditional financial world where arguably then they can control um, the, the privacy you know, um, uh, um, uh, rules uh, according to legal jurisdictions and whatnot. But um, even in the crypto world, I think it, works, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think Jay makes some good points there. I think interoperability has uh, the potential to sort of uh, put uh, increased access into, as he says, these privacy on the edges. Um, if we can figure out a way to sort of allow people to interoperate with more privacy-preserving chains, um, it can be sort of a, a lever towards that direction. Um, but similarly, as he says, like accounting is really important when you're doing interoperability. And so it definitely has the potential to sort of become swing the other way and to say like, I need to know a sufficient set of information in order to make interoperability possible. And the simple answer is like, just give me all your balances and give me everything. It's very nice that way. Um, and so like the trade off there will probably again be in like speed, computational complexity and developer experience, like all of these things where it's like, we could imagine maybe doing this in zero knowledge or in some sort of technology that allows us to preserve privacy, but will that be the default? Will people be willing to put up with the difficulty of doing so in the complexity? Like perhaps not. So then in a world where we can interoperate with privacy coins, does that make every coin a privacy coin? No. <laughs> Well, there, there might be a zone connected to a hub whose only function is to provide privacy for any number of assets or coins that might want to IBC transfer in. So as soon as that service or blockchain exists connected to, say, the Cosmos hub, I would say, yeah, every coin becomes a private coin. But what are my legal obligations as a validator <laughs> allowing people access to this, like, private zone? Very, very open question at this point in terms yeah. of, like, if I'm the gateway to this secret door of privacy over here, it's unlikely that I can, you know, play dumb forever and be like, I, I was just facilitating transactions, officer. I don't know. I'm just a minor. <laughs> Okay, um, so in, in, a, in a world where we have uh, this, this true kind of multi-blockchain interoperability utopia that we're painting, um, what is that going to mean for the future of network effects? Because the way that we think about network effects today, we kind of imagine these individual blockchains and we imagine this very, very high friction between using one token and another and, you know, are there ways that we think about the security models of blockchains that break down? when we introduce interoperability? Yeah, so, so the network effects question is really interesting. I think, so uh, we've spent a, like, probably the last 12 years building a lot of consumer products. So what we've done is that we've actually studied a lot of how networks get bootstrapped. And it actually turns out that almost every successful network or marketplace product is usually bootstrapped off of an existing one. So in the case of Facebook, it was Facebook was bootstrapped off of people's email addresses. Same for LinkedIn. WhatsApp was off of people's phone contacts. Uh, Pinterest and Zynga was off of the Facebook platform. Uh, Airbnb was off of Craigslist, so like that, right? And I think when you look at that model, you'll see a very interesting trend with blockchains, kind of in a more parallel model. But let me, let me give you a scenario. So let's say, and this is kind of looking from the perspective of having an application that works across multiple chains. So let's say you have blockchain A, which is super popular, has millions of people using it, is, is really great, right? So now let's say there's a blockchain, an application which spans blockchain A and blockchain B. And blockchain B is this really small chain that's not very popular, not used very much, right? So if blockchain A 
it, a lot of blockchain A users start using the application, then suddenly you'll see like a, almost like a migration, not a migration because people aren't leaving, but uh, a shift of all the users who are on A getting aware of blockchain B, and you can use that as like a way to bootstrap blockchain B's application. So, so it's a very interesting model where you can see these people with, you can see new chains building off of existing chains, and that can only happen when you have something like interoperability. I'll take a different approach at it. I look at this a lot the way that video games are actually manufactured. Um, so if you think about the way that platforms are done today, Xbox or PlayStation or Nintendo or whatever it might be, is that you have this, or at least early on especially, is that it was kind of, you go to one platform because it was the only one that would first issue you know, a certain video game. And, you know, and it, it was very good, and they always are very good at you know, bringing in a certain amount of you know, participants and users. Um, and if you look at Fortnite today as a big transition to this, is you have this now more of a universality as these things are starting to kind of come into more of the idea that you know, the more that I can get a game onto every single platform, although it might start on one, it starts to then you know, merge into all these other ones. And the question is actually, I think that as long as you can keep the, the, the incentives aligned, then that layer, that actual use case layer, the Fortnite, if you will, um, all of these things allows us all to network and play across multiple, no matter what the actual system is. Um, so I think that that's where we're going. I think today it looks more like the early days of Xbox and PlayStation. I think the first network that offers a good framework, fast consensus, finality, and proper IBC is going to develop a network effect and it can kind of direct how this whole, uh, whole system kind of shapes up depending on you know, execution ability. Um, so, for example, like one thing that's going to be important um, in the emerging interoperability, blockchain interoperability world is the ability to say, you know, here's my blockchain application. Uh, now I want some validator set to run it, right? Um, and uh, so there needs to be some on-ramp to make it easy for uh, people to say, you know, uh, I, just, I just want a reasonably secure blockchain validator as a service platform, and I just, I just want to launch this here. And then we're going to need protocols to, like, to be able to transfer that blockchain application from one validator set to another validator set by upgrading to a, perhaps a larger set, or maybe, maybe even the Cosmos Hub validators too. Right? So there's going to be a need to migrate and change the validator sets. Um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is there's going to be infrastructure that makes it easy to scale to run uh, for a validator set to offer uh, the validation across many parallel blockchains. And um, you know, this is just another thing that's going to determine which hub creates a network effect. I think uh, interoperability presents the, the possibility that uh, sort of the utility po uh, hypothesis kind of plays out in that those chains which provide the most utility in aggregate will have the most users, and that rather than thinking about coin holding preference, it'll just be users. And you know, Facebook doesn't need to issue a coin to say, I have a lot of users. There will be a similar analogy of if you make a killer application, that, that thing will be valuable. And the fact that it may be backed by a token will make that token valuable as well. Um, but it'll be abstracted away so that you know, when it's useful, when it's used, it'll be valuable. And people won't think so much about, you know, I am holding this particular token for this purpose. Awesome. Okay, well, so I think we're just about out of time. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for this conversation. It's been super interesting. Uh, can we get a round of applause for these uh, participants? Thank you so much. Thank you.